Chapter 7, Working with Others. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Practical experience. shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. Can't reach my sponsor, work with somebody else. Can't seem to pray, work with somebody else. Can't make it to a meeting or I make it to the meetings and it's just not work with somebody else. Writing is not doing it, work with somebody else. Nothing ensures immunity from drinking like working with another one. Basis of what it is we do. It's the basis of what it is we do. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. A couple of places they place promises in here. There are some other promises later on in this chapter, but right at the front, life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Those are some powerful promises. How many people have experienced life taking on new meaning? Life taking on meaning at all. Have any of you ever seen anybody recover? Have you watched somebody recover? Have you seen the loneliness vanish? Come in, back here like this, standoffish, shy, scared, shaky, don't want to reach out to anybody, broken, feeling like they're not enough. That's not in my, that's not just my experience. This one is the different one. When we see them come in, and then 60 days later, Six months later, you see them and they're standing in the corner and they got a little crew with them. I do a workshop on Sunday mornings and sometimes I just stand back because I've seen people come, didn't know anybody. And it's not so much I get to interact with people, but I like to see the new guys and the new ladies get their little crews. And you see them standing around and they used to be standoffish. And you see them start to blossom and you see them having friends. And sometimes you just stand back and try it if you haven't tried it. Listen to the music in the rooms. Listen to the laughter. You just stand back and just listen to the knots of people. Listen to them laugh, the new people. Pick out somebody that you saw them come in and they were just terrified. And to see loneliness disappear. You know. To see a fellowship grow up about you to have a host of friends. Friends benefits, but they're the deal. I'm a friend, you know, some people say, I didn't come here for friends. Well, I was a, a very social guy. I drank, I went to parties and, and got loaded, you know. I used to have real nice parties, you know. Um, I used to go and still do now that I'm sober. I, I'm a guy that gets out and mingles with people. So friends, some people will say it's a fringe benefit and they're not important, but for a guy like me, they meant a lot. For a guy like me, this fellowship means a lot. You know, it still does. When people stop me in there and say, you know, I thank you for coming, it still means a lot to me. It means everything to me if you come from where I come from. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. 
when we did that deal about resting on laws and why it's so easy, it's because it's easy to get disconnected. It's easy to rest on yesterday's scores and think I'm going to win the day's game. This is the antidote. I don't even have to worry about resting on my laurels if I'm doing this. Don't even have to think about it. Don't even have to worry, God, I got to watch out for watching. No, you don't. Just get in the activity of working with others. If I'm working with others, I'm going to be going to meetings. If I'm working with others, I'm going to be doing service. If I'm working with others, I'm going to stay current and I'm going to stay involved in the action of this program. If I'm really working with others, now, there are some people who do the working with others deal in a different way. We're going to talk about 12-step work. You know, we're, we'll talk about 12-step work. From the moment I hit the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but constant thought, my very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on my constant thought of others and how I can meet their needs. We read that a long time ago. So from the very minute I hit the rooms, I start doing work with other alcoholics. You know, before I had gone through the process, my sponsor said, before you have a message to carry to the alcoholic, carry the alcoholic to the message. That's your service work. You got a little bucket, put somebody in it. Drive them to the meeting. Take them to the meeting. You know, take them to the meeting. And so, but 12-step work is, just, is a little bit different than just one alcoholic sharing with another. 12-step work has this element to it, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message. So first I got to have a message to carry. First I have an awakened spirit. And I put that awakened spirit in the service. And there's some vital suggestions about working with others. And in this chapter, it's suggestions about working with others on them, just on a, going out and working with new people. It's some suggestions about how to interact with others throughout, I mean, throughout uh, the fellowship. It's some suggestions about sponsorship in here. And if I read this, it's some valuable suggestions for me on how to interact. I mean, this chapter is full of stuff. I'm going to bullet point it. Uh, for some of the suggestions, some valuable suggestions. Now, even though it doesn't say who not to work with or who I cannot work with, if I read it carefully, I'll find out. What do you mean, who not to work with, Ralph? Well, stay with me. At the bottom of 89, there's a sentence. Not really interested in the start of it, but I'm going to give a complete sentence. Ministers and doctors are competent, and you can learn much from them if you wish. Here's the part I want to talk about. It happens that because of your drinking experience, you can be uniquely useful to other alcoholics. First suggestion, cooperate, never criticize. To be helpful is our only aim. Now, when I went to pick my son up, and we'll read some other qualifications and conditions I couldn't meet, too. When I went to pick him up at that gas station the other day and he didn't get in the car, very pissed off. But more than pissed off, that day, I was scared and I was hurt. I was scared and I was hurt. But one of the reasons I haven't been able to work with that young man is for four, it's, I, have four bro, I have five brothers. Four of us ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. None of us have ever tried to 12-step one another. And one of the reasons why we never did, and one of the reasons I can't 12-step my son, I could pick him up and take him to a facility, but I can't 12-step him, is I can't meet the conditions. Cooperate, never criticize. I, I, I can't stop myself from criticizing. Later on, there will be some other conditions I couldn't meet when it came to him. Ralph, wh where does the book say that? It doesn't. I'm telling you. Remember when we read an inventory, don't lie to yourself about values? Self-honesty throughout this program, that's one of the byproducts of what will come out. And you better be honest with yourself, and my experience shows me. Because later on we're going to read where there are no axes to grind, no decks. You know, I can't meet. We, we read them earlier, you know, some qualifications. But cooperate, never criticize. To be helpful is our only aim. That's not my only aim. To be helpful is not my only aim when it comes to him. You know, uh, I got a definite agenda. You need to do this. You're killing your mom. You're killing me. I don't treat him like I treat another newcomer. And, and we'll read some other conditions that I couldn't meet when it came to that. <laughs> Page 90. Let's bullet point. When you discover a prospect for AA, find out all you can about him. If he doesn't want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. You may spoil a later opportunity. 
We want you when alcohol is through with you. I'm not in the debating society, and I'm not in the persuading and convincing society. If you're not convinced from your experience, you're not ready to go. Leave it alone. Might spoil an opportunity later. So we already said cooperate, never criticize, to be helpful is my only aim. Now when I discover somebody, find out what I can about them. We'll read a bit later on how to do that. But the first thing, if he doesn't want to stop, don't try to persuade him. Middle of page 90. Sometimes it is wise to wait till he goes on a binge. Companion sentence to that on page 91 in the middle. Call on him while he is still jittery. He may be more receptive when depressed. I like that. I like that. And I don't sugarcoat it and I talk to him. He may be more receptive and that was me. That was me. I went into treatment when I was very jittery and when I was very depressed. Bottom of page 90. If he does not want to see you, never force yourself on him. And we're just doing bullet points, you know. And, it's, and, these, and these ideas, you know, they fleshed out in the paragraphs, but these are some working suggestions and directions for working with new people, especially wet ones. On page 91, I got somebody, he's sitting in front of me. Tell him about your drinking habits, symptoms, tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. If he's in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you. Being careful not to moralize a lecture. Again, one of the reasons I cannot work with my son or somebody close to me. I'm moralizing, I'm lecturing, I'm lecturing like you wouldn't believe and couldn't stop myself. What I did with my baby brother when I brought him to the program, I told him I'd pay him $5 to go to a meeting with me. <laughs> Took him to my home group. There's a guy in my home group, my baby brother, there's a real guy. My baby brother was a, unlike Bob knows my brother Ron, he's in there. and my other brother Reggie, we even call us on off the car. My baby brother was different than any of us. You know, he was really in the life, real, you know, caught up in and fast money guy. He was like that. And there was a guy in my home group that was a young guy. Had been sober longer than me, and he reminded me of my baby brother. So when I <clears throat> bribed him with the $5 and he showed up at the meeting, I introduced him to my guy told Carl who her baby, and I left it alone. Left it alone. I did not have it in me to not moralize, lecture, do any of that. You know, so my experience, some other people's experience might be different. My experience is I, I cannot meet these conditions when it comes to my family. At the bottom of 91, when he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell how baffled you were, how you finally learned you were sick, give account of your struggles, show him the mental twist. All that means I need to know that. I need to know that. That's why this is a 12-step call and I have some ideas about what this disease is. And I can tell him what the mental twist is. Mental twist, when I don't want to, I do it anyway. I find an insanely trivial excuse to start, e even when I have everything to lose. The peculiar mental twist, that's part of alcoholism. Show them the mental twist which leads to the first drink. You know, we suggest you do this as we have done in the chapter on alcoholism in chapter three, mental states that precede a relapse in the drinking. They're covered in that chapter. Suggest that we do it. You know. If you're satisfied he's a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. How am I supposed to be satisfied? Trust your intuition. Bob was talking again about intuitive thought. I've been doing this long enough. Some people will say, well, I make a mistake. And what? I make a mistake. A guy that's got a bad drinking problem, I believe he is alcoholic. I direct him to alcoholic and I'm what? You know. Ralph, you know, so if I'm satisfied, it says if you're satisfied, use discretion. You're at the 12 step now, you know, have a lot of experience working with people. I have my own experience. We uniquely qualify. It shrinks and doctors who misdiagnose, oh, this guy is suffering from a severe pace of uh, depression. Are you drinking every day? 
he he ain't suffering from depression. He's suffering from alcoholism. You know, <laughs> we uniquely qualified to see that. You know. Uh, Bottom, in the bottom of 92, continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness of fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of mind and body which accompany it. Now do you see why 12-step work is a little bit different? Because there's some information I bring to the table. You know, I have an understanding of what it is that I suffer from. And that's the good news, and that's one of the reasons why it helps to read the big book Alcoholics Anonymous if you're going to be really doing 12-step work. It refers to, refer to the way we did it in Chapter 3. You know, there's a lot of reference in here. It's not saying it, but there are a lot of references to what we talked about in the doctor's opinion. You know, there are lots of references in here. If I'm going to work with somebody and be armed with some facts about myself and about the nature of my illness, I get them from the, reading this book up to this point. At the bottom of 92, it says, there's a sentence that says, even though your protege may not have entirely admitted his condition, he has become very curious to know how you got well. Let him ask you that question if he will. Tell him exactly what happened to you. If the man is agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic. He does not have to agree with your conception of God. He can choose any conception he likes provided it makes sense to him. The main thing is he'd be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and he live by spiritual principles. When dealing with such a person, you had better use everyday language to describe spiritual principles. Don't be thee-ing and thou and grace of, you know, and Bob, as we just talk about, and, and talking to him in cliches. He's not in the rooms. You know, first things, for, we do first things first, and, you know, easy. To, no, talk in everyday language. Know your audience. Know who you're talking to. You know, Bob a moment ago talked about he tries not to cuss because he doesn't want to offend anybody in the rooms, and that's because he's talking to a lot of people. When you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you don't talk to a guy on a Harley Davidson the same way you talk to an incoming priest. You might. I know some priests that you, you, you definitely might, you know. But you, you know, you get my point. Talk to your, know who it is you're talking to, and talk to them in their language. Talk to them in their language, you know. I suffer from this allergy and this. What the hell is this guy talking about? You know, I might have to explain what that is later on, but I better just start. Man, you know what? When I get started, I can't stop. I don't know if that's true for you. You know, I, I take one and I get thirstier. I say stuff like that. You know, oh, I suffer from something. I, a psychic change is what overcame me. Who did they send Who did they send me again? You know. You know. Here's one that you may have encountered. We got one going on like this right now. Just talk to my sponsor. Your prospect may belong to a religious denomination. This is on 93. He, his religious education and training may be far superior to yours. In that case, he's going to wonder how you can add anything to what he already knows. Here's the answer. You got somebody coming in here, you you know, you got somebody who can quote more Bible and scripture than you can. You got somebody who knows it backwards and forwards. You tell them this and you tell them in their language. Okay, man, I'm not here to talk to you about religion. That's cool. You probably know more than me. But check this out. Why are you drinking? The book says, call to his attention the fact that however deep in his faith and knowledge, he could not have applied it or he would not drink. All that's well and good. Bob said it another way. Is it working for you? Is it working for you? 94 outlined the program of action, and then it goes into depth about how to outline that program of action in that paragraph. He's not under any obligation to you. You want him to help others. It's important that he plays so he doesn't have to see you again. That paragraph is full of information. Uh, outline the program of action. You know. Candidate may tell you why he may not need to follow all of it. Don't contradict those views. I felt the same way as you did. 95. You will be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit passion for crusade or reform. Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual 
hilltop. Don't talk down. Lay out the kid of spiritual tools for his inspection. Show him how they work. Offer friendship and fellowship. Tell him if he want to get well, he'll do. You'll do anything to help. If he's on, if he's not interested in your solution, if he expects you to act as a banker, form or a nurse for his priest, you may have to drop him till he changes his mind. He may have to get hurt some more. If he thinks he can do the job in some other way or prefer some other approach, encourage him to follow his own conscience. We have no monopoly on God. We have merely found an approach that works for us. Hey, man, have at it. You want to go to church? Have at it. I'm telling you what works for a guy like me. I'm just telling you. I'm just sharing with you what worked for me. Don't be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another one and try again. Plenty of prospects. That's at the top of 96. Um, On the bottom of 96, there's a paragraph that talks about he might be broken homeless. I want to talk about this paragraph on 97 and share with you the other 12-step promises. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the good Samaritan every day if need be. Here are the promises. It may mean the loss of many nights sleep. Great interference with your pleasures. Interruptions to your business. It may mean sharing your money in your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to police courts, sanitariums, hospitals, jails, asylums, we could say treatment centers, recovery homes, at it. Your telephone may jangle at any time of the day or the night. Your wife may sometimes say she's neglected. A drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. You may have to fight with him. Sometimes you have to call a doctor and a minister sedatives under his direction. Another time you may have to send for the police or an ambulance. Occasionally you'll have to meet some conditions, such conditions. Those are the 12-step promises. (laughs) Makes you want to sign up, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe you just could burn your furniture and get in the fight and have it done with. Um, <laughs> At the front end. At the front end, right. <laughs> this is, uh, I think this, this is the step, this is why we're here. We don't know it. We think we're here for ourselves. We think we're here to fix ourselves, but we're not. We're here to free ourselves and to claim our rightful place, a place of usefulness. I I don't know that I would have survived. I, I don't believe I could have survived myself in my early sobriety. Um, I I think God works through people. There's a covenant that when two or more gather for the purpose of recovery, that he will be in the midst. And, uh, you know, I look back, the the old timers, when I was new, really seemed to push me into a lot of 12-step work. At least that was my experience. And looking back objectively, I don't think they were pushing other people as much into it as they pushed me into it. And maybe they knew something. Uh, maybe they knew that I was so self-involved and I was the type of alcoholic that was prone to depression and a lot of worry and that I, I, would, I had a seven-year track record of relapse that I was the guy who was going to have to start doing this right away. Um, a question often arises and, and, and I think there's some bad answers to this question and the question is well how long should I be sober before I start doing 12 step work um, I've heard 
treatment centers and counselors and even people in AA say things to newcomers like, oh, yes, you should wait a year or two. You know something? I'm really glad no one told Bill Wilson that or none of us would be here. Huh. He, he did, I mean, he, he wasn't even done vibrating yet. He's out beating the bushes looking for people to help. Uh, because God had put that spark in him. I think that's, I, I think the greatest element of divine intervention that happened that uh, provided us to be here today is that Bill Wilson, in after his spiritual experience, got the got the fire for helping others, because alcoholics have been getting, having spiritual experiences throughout history, and what is seems to be often common is that they wear off. But Bill somehow God put the intuitive knowledge that if he threw himself into helping others, somehow he could keep this alive inside of him and in those of us that are around here one of the reasons Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't get stale is we give it away I mean when you think of it objectively I mean I've averaged I probably averaged 10 meetings a week for over 30 years now if I was only if I'm only coming to AA to get something well, after about 10 years, I would have heard about everything I'm going to hear. You know what I mean? It's like, stop it. I mean, enough. Why does guys like me continue to come? Why do guys like Tom Ivester with 52 years are pretty much everyday members of Alcoholics Anonymous? Because we make the transition from a receiver, from a taker to a receiver to a giver. I... Uh, I run into people all the time that uh, are physically sober for many, many years, and they don't do this. And they don't do it because they've, they've sold themselves a bill of goods. And they're still really listening to this. And this is, here's what this is telling you. Well, I don't really feel ready to help anybody. I... I think I need more work on me. Huh. I'll help somebody once I get my house in order and once I feel better, once I get my life straightened out, then, I'm, then I could probably help somebody. But right now, I, I'm so painfully aware of all these deficiencies and vacancies in my life. My emotional well-being isn't really that good yet. And, and my, my thinking is not really that good yet. And I'm not very comfortable yet. And I, I said pretty much that very same, I had that same conversation out loud with an old timer in AA. And when I told him that I didn't feel ready, he said to me, he said, if you wait until you feel you're ready to help somebody before you help someone, you'll have already died of alcoholism. Ralph said something I'd never heard before earlier this weekend, and I wrote it down in my book, and I thought it was fantastic. He said, God does not pick the qualified, he qualifies the picks. That's exactly right. You, you become the guy who's capable of carrying the message by carrying the message. And you make a lot of mistakes. I made, I wish I would have read this book when I was new. I just got shot out of a cannon into 12-step work fanatically without any any structure or principles. So what, what happens when you do that and you're like me? It's just like Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson's dragging him off bar stools. He had to have Silkworth had to say, stop, stop preaching to these people. Stop it. And had, Bill had no one. And Bill was ready to quit. And Lois, Lois he said to Lois, I, this isn't working. I'm going to quit. And Lois said, but you're sober. Uh and then Silkworth said, you got to stop preaching. It was the first piece of structure in the 12th step that ever entered into Alcoholic Psalms. Don't preach these people. Tell them exactly what happened to you. Talk about the phenomenon of the craving. Talk about the disease as we've talked about it. Let them connect. And oddly enough, he had that conversation with Dr. Silkworth right before his trip to Akron. 
and that's why the first of 12 step call that was effective he had that was the missing piece bill had had the spiritual experience he'd had the entrenchment in the oxford group he believed god was the answer and he was hammering people with that and uh i don't know i don't know about you guys but you get me in the my cups and you start hammering me with god and it's like oh no and if i can't get away from you i'm gonna oh it's just i think I, oh. <laughs> I had a guy I, I was I, I come to one morning I with the shakes and I was on my way to the state store kind of you know when you really really need a drink how you're, you have that sense of urgency about you to get well and, and I'm on my way to the state store and I ran into a guy on the corner that I I used to run with I shot drugs with this guy I drank wine with this guy I even pulled some crimes with this guy and I looked at him and he was like Ebby was to Bill Wilson clean clear eyed and everything right he had a book under his arm not the big book it was the bible right and he starts preaching to me right I had to finally threaten him with violence in order to get him to stop I mean just stop I don't want to hear that I just, he just made me want to drink more I mean he did you know and Silkworth, just the first piece of structure. Because all, without, the, without the structure and without the principles, all I'm, bringing, all I'm carrying is really the disease. And I think we're going to carry the message, we're going to carry the disease. We don't have a choice, we're going to carry something. And so what had happened is I, all I had to bring to the table was ego. I took every 12-step call, and I went on a lot of them. And I took every one of them personal. Like, as if this guy is going to stay sober or I'm going to going to kill him if he doesn't. Because if he doesn't stay sober, I'm going to look bad. The key word is I. I am going to look bad, right? Ego. Because that's all I had. I didn't have any principles. I just had self. You know, in the 12th tradition, it says we put principles before personalities. Now, whose personality do you think that would be? Right. See, so I don't have any principles. I just got personality. Uh, and so I, I, I'm causing a lot of problems. I am preaching to people. Unfortunately, I, I, I think I did more harm than good with a lot of guys. I, I think that, that I had actually gotten 12-step calls uh, in the middle of the night through central office, and I'd put on my uh, – for uh, people who don't really want to quit drinking yet. Now, maybe six months later they would have. Mm -hmm. But at this point, they're just they're not at their bottom yet, but they're kind of circling it. And it's it's three o'clock in the morning, they're out of vodka, they're lonely, they call AA. They don't want to quit drinking, you know, but I don't I don't interview them. I don't find out if they want to quit drinking. I put on my cape, I start playing in my head the theme song to Mighty Mouse, you know, here I come to save the day, right? Charge out full of ego to, to fix these people. Cause I need another notch in my big book or something, you know, right? I, I because um, when you're the egomaniac with the inferiority complex, you don't measure up. I, 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 I feel like i got to have 500 successful 12-step calls to feel even to the guy who helps one person. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm coming from behind. And I, 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 I think I got some of these guys that maybe in six months would have been ready for AA. And after experiencing me, maybe they'll never be ready. <laughs> It's, it's funny, but it's kind of sad. And, and I didn't do it out of malice. I did it out of ignorance. But ignorance in this universe is as deadly as malice. Look at how many people are killed with guns by accident because someone around them is playing with a gun that doesn't know how to handle a gun. And they're not killed by malice. They're killed by ignorance. Ignorance it can be just as deadly in this universe as malice. And it's, it's sadder, actually. At least with malice, the guy had a reason. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm a knucklehead. And yet, something started to happen to me as a result of, of going on these 12-step calls. And I, I started do, taking meetings into the detox, and, in, and when I was two months sober, I got started going out to Gene Prison. I got cleared. You couldn't even do that today. You can't. You can't go to, into Gene Prison with or well, 
or Indian Springs, any of the prisons with two months of sobriety now. But back in those days, they didn't have the standards. And I, I started doing some of this stuff, and, and something started to happen to me. That, but I, I'm, not a, I'm not awake to what's happening. And what's happening is here's a guy who, for the most part, on his own is depressed, uh, full of worry and, and, and concern almost to the point of an obsessiveness about me and my future and my past. I am not doing very well. And yet there, I have these little islands in my day where I've come out of a detox after talking to some guy or, or spending two hours with a guy on a 12-step call and my spirit would be lighter and freer. And then I would just start to slowly revert back into myself again. So because it's not a once and for all fix, I don't get that it's working. Now, isn't that crazy? I never expected a bottle of whiskey to, to be able to drink it and I still feel good from it three weeks later. I never expected that. Why would I expect that, that this treatment for alcoholism would work more better than whiskey would? And, and yet that would happen. So I discount it. It's not working. This stuff isn't doing me any good. And uh, I had a, an experience when I was about a little over a year, year and a half, maybe a year and a half sober. I got to a bad spot in my life. Uh, I had a relationship that had ended, and I had I was going through. A, I went through a couple jobs, and uh, and I I'm a depressive by nature. I, here's the kind of guy I am. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that can be doing very well and have a good day. And this happened to me. I remember walking into a meeting one night, and I had I had a good day at work. Not all my days at work were good. This was a good one. I had spent I'd had dinner with some people in AA at Denny's. We were coming. I'm coming into the meeting. A guy meets me at the door of the meeting. He's a greeter named Wade. Wade shakes my hand, looks me right in the eye, and said, "Bob." How you doing? How you really doing? And I said, I'm I'm doing fine. And I went and sat down and I started thinking, what does he know? <laughs> <laughs> I started, man, I you know, I don't even really feel very good now that I think <laughs> And I started thinking about how my job, what's wrong in my life? And the more I examined my life, the crappier it looked. I, as I started looking at my job, my job's crap. So I started looking at the past relationship. I know I'm going to be alone forever and it's going to be horrible. I, 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 as, I, as I focus obsessively on my emotions, my past and my future, I'm, say, I'm in this abyss. I feel terrible. And what's changed? Nothing. Nothing. Clancy says, this is a disease of perception. What happened to my perception? It went from right out here being present in life right back into here. And I don't know that the 12th step is our way of helping or allowing, not helping, but allowing God. It's the actions we take which allow God to carry out the thing we've asked him for in the third step, to relieve me of the bondage of self. My friend Bob, Bob from, uh, from St. Paul says that, uh, he says a surgeon doesn't heal. He creates an antiseptic environment in which God can heal. A farmer doesn't grow. He creates a, a nourishing, fertile environment by which God can grow. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we create an environment and a discipline and a set of actions in which God can work. And it is in the 12th step that I, God relieves me of the bondage of self. And, and you can't manufacture it. It's not every 12-step call I went on didn't, didn't free me up. I had some that were just a pain in the butt. Where after, it's like after I, get, I drop the guy off, I feel like I need a meeting. You ever had those kind of 12-step calls, right? right? Um, but what, what started happening is periodically, and for more times than not, I would get free. Well, I'm a year and a half sober. I've, I've ended a relationship. My job life is crap. Um, it looks pretty bleak, really. I'm working minimum wage, struggling paycheck to paycheck. I never, I don't have any people in AA are going places and doing things and buying cars, and I don't get nothing. 
seemingly, I've gotten the greatest gift I've ever asked for, and that's to be sober. Now I'm looking for my reward for allowing God to give me the gift. Right? That speaks volumes of my self-centeredness. Uh, so I, I come home from, from work, and I'm sitting in my, on my sofa in my apartment, and I'm just pondering this stuff, and I'm sinking into this deep depression. And it's bleak. And I, I, I don't know what to do. I, 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 don't get, I don't just get sad or depressed. I get into it. I mean, I get into it. I have been so, I've gotten into it so deeply at times where I feel like I weigh 1,000 pounds, where it, has, it starts to have a physiological effect on me. I get so sick of spirit. The book says, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Well, you allow me to get spiritually sick enough, I start getting physically weird and mentally weird. And I'm just into this. And I, I'm stuck on this sofa. I, it was like, a, I think just was sagging. I was so depressed. I think I needed to sag. And I was like, it was horrible. And I can't get out of it. And I, and yet, I'm a victim of a delusion. I can rest at satisfaction and happiness. I think... I think that the answer is I need to think about my life more deeply and I'll get out of it. That's like trying to get out of a depression by thinking is like trying to dig your way out of a hole. You just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I don't know what to do and it's horrible. You know, being, dep- being full of self-pity with a bottle of vodka, you can, get, you can get some kind of warm fuzzies out of that. Sober, it's brutal. It's brutal. And I'm, uh, I'm into this, and I look at the clock, and it's almost 10 o'clock at night. And there's a meeting at a quarter after 10 up on the strip at a, at a little chapel up there called Duffy's. And I, I said a little prayer, and somehow I thought if I could get to the meeting. And somehow I got off that sofa. It was very hard. I got off that sofa, and I, I, I got out to my car, and I, I feel I'm like a mope. i just shuffling. I, I don't just get depressed. I think my freaking hair gets depressed. I think every I just look depressed. You know, I walk depressed. I did, I I get depressed. I get that burdened walk. You know, just you know, even affects my speech. Yeah, I'm the kind of guy when I'm in the middle of depression. If you say something, to me, how you doing, Bob? I go. Oh. You know, it's, I, I get into it, man. And I get to the meeting, and I I'm sitting in the meeting, but I can't hear nothing. I am so self-obsessed and so internally focused and self-absorbed that what's going on in the meeting is like very, very far away. Like you don't even hear it because I'm so much listening to my thoughts and looking at my feelings that what's going on in the, in the meeting is so distant and vague like music in a doctor's office. You know, how you don't even listen, you don't even hear it, right? Um, there's a guy across from me coming off a drunk he's in bad bad shape he, he he looks like he wants to come apart at the seams he's he's grabbing himself and rocking back and forth because he has he's grabbing himself because he has the tremors so bad trying to still them and he periodically just can't sit he gets up pacing back and forth every once in a while he goes into the bathroom and you can hear him in there throw a dry heaving and it's just it's just noisy it's it's i listen i'm trying to figure out my life this guy's annoying the crap out of me really I, the meeting's over i have not gotten any help i i stay after to help this guy charlie parker with the, the chairs and everything and charlie's on his way to work charlie and i are the last two people to meet leave the meeting we get outside he's locked charlie's locking up we look across and the guy from the meeting's laying on the ground next to my car like I will, I will just about have to step over him to get in my car and go home and do what I want to do, which is think more deeply. But Charlie's standing there, and Charlie can't help him. He's got to go to work, and Charlie's asking me if I'm gonna, you know, can you do something with this guy? And I don't, I don't want to talk to this guy. Uh, but if I, I'm afraid that if I don't at least go over and talk to him, that. Charlie's got a big mouth. He'll tell everybody in AA what a lousy member I am. So I go over to the guy, and he's a mess. He's peed his pants. He stinks. He's, he's afraid he's going to go into convulsions. Um, he doesn't have any medical insurance, the thoughtlessness of that. So there's nowhere to take him. They had, Westcare hadn't opened yet, and 
There was only, yeah, if you had insurance, you'd go to the care unit, but you don't have no insurance. There was only one option in those days. There was actually two. One of them, we used to detox people in our apartments. But you'd sit with a guy. It was, it was, it'd be a little messy. Sometimes they'd, they'd flop around like a fish out of water on your living room floor. I've, I've seen that many times. Uh, but usually do that with two people, and you do it in shifts. And I can't do it. i got to go to work tomorrow. So the only one option left, and that's take him to the county hospital. I'd been down there before on 12-step calls. It's, it's, it's a tedious process. They don't like alcoholics there. They're, they're forced to take a certain amount of indigent patients because they get some kind of government money, I guess. And, but they don't like it, especially drunks. They've got a bad attitude towards drunks. They, they, they treat alcoholics as if they don't, they're not really sick. Like they'll, they'll put you on hold in debt for a long, long time and treat people that they think are legitimately sick rather than these self-induced guys that are probably going to be back here next month anyway. they got a bad attitude. I, I know. I've been down there before. So I know I'm going to be, I got five, six hours in that waiting room. I am not happy about this. And I got this guy in my car and I'm driving down there and I'm, I'm half-assed pissed off. I, I just think, you know, it's, I got to go to work tomorrow. I'm going to be tired. I'm not going to have any sleep. I'm going to have a bad attitude. I'll probably get in a fight with my boss and lose my job, but it's a lousy job anyway. <laughs> Doesn't anybody else step up to the plate except me, and the key word is me, 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 me. Well, we get down there, we sign in, and we're sitting in the waiting room, and the guy starts to talk to me, he starts to open up to me. He's really in bad shape. And he starts to tell me about the, the shame and the remorse that he feels for the things he'd done to hurt the people who loved him. And he talked about an incident with his, uh, this girl he was engaged to be married to that was almost identical to something I'd went through when I was drinking. He said he couldn't even effectively drink the remorse and the shame away anymore. And I remember that at the end. At the end of, the, the end of my drinking, there was no relief for me. There was oblivion. But I couldn't get, there was a time in my drinking where I could get high and not care, where the stuff wouldn't bother me anymore. But at the end of my drinking, the only, the, the only relief I had was oblivion. But then the problem with oblivion is the next instant you know you're coming too, right? So there really isn't any relief in drinking at the end for a guy like me. And he's talking about that. He said that for some time he'd been trying to get up enough courage to kill himself. And then he really gets me. He said... I never forget, he said to me, he says, I don't know why you're wasting time with me. I'm not like you. I always drink again. I remember thinking that in AA meetings. I remember sitting in meetings and thinking, that's fine for you, but I'm not like you. See, I can't stay sober. And he has been telling me about me. And somewhere in the wee hours of the morning as I'm sitting there with this guy, I tell you something, I fell in love with him. There was a moment when I wanted him to be happy and sober and okay probably more than I wanted it for myself. And I don't know why I fell in love with this guy. He can't do anything for me. He can't get me a better job. He, he's probably not even going to stay sober a year and give me some kind of credit for something. <laughs> But I realized much later that I had fallen in love with the me that is in him. See, that he, he is me. And they eventually checked him into that uh, detox, or that hospital, and gave him a bed in there to detox him. And I remember driving home, and the sun's almost getting ready, starting to get ready to come up, and, and I'm, uh, I'm driving home and I'm crying. And I'm not crying because I'm depressed now. I'm crying because I, I get it. I get that uh, this is what I need to do. I'm crying because I don't know in my whole life I ever felt more complete, more right about my life. Everything made sense. I felt a connectedness to life itself and the presence of God in that car driving home. It was unbelievable. And it didn't come from prayer and meditation. It came from exactly what Bill talks about in his story. That we, if we, he says, if the alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life, 
not through prayer meditation, but through self-sacrifice and constant work with others, we will never survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. In Bill's story, he also talks about the treatment that he discovered for depression. And oddly enough, when years later, when he started getting really into the deep depressions again, he'd forgot their treatment. He was living up in Bedford Hills, way far away from the trenches of, of uh, Calvary Mission and Towns Hospital. But he discovered, he, he says in his story that often he'd just sink into this abyss, and, as I would in early sobriety. And he said he would go over to the hospital and he'd spend some time with a new guy that's trying to get sober. And he said he would be miraculously uplifted. And then he goes on to say, and it never fails. It never fails. If you want to get goosed by the Spirit, you got to get up off your butt. And I, I, I run into people... And Alcoholics Anonymous that have done really good with the first 11 steps and they never give it away. And if you never give it away, you're stuck. And you know you're stuck because it feels like you're stuck. How come I'm not, how come I'm not happy, joyous, and free? You know, all the promises in all, there's promises in step 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, and 12. They're, we call them promises because it sounds flowery. I'll tell you what they really are. They're checklists. If what they're talking about here after this step, if you haven't got it, you've missed something. Go back. Go back. Somewhere in the process, you missed something. They're almost like checklists. They're, they're, the, the big book is, is, is set up in three... All the actions are set up in three parts. They're set up to tell you the predisposition. Are, are you this guy? Are you the guy who's like the actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange? Are you selfish and self-centered? Are you constantly in collision with something or somebody? Can you become convinced of these certain things? Can you enter into this decision wholeheartedly? Have you thought well about it? And if you've really surrendered to the decision, certain things should be in place in you. Then, then you have the third step promises. Do you have a feeling now that you're going to be okay because you've got a new employer? Now that you've made this decision, are you less worried about your job? Do you kind of know it doesn't matter anymore? That you're going to be okay? And, constantly, and all, through the, all through the steps, they're checklists. Is this true? Did I, am I here? Am I here? Is this true? Is this true? Now, none of this stuff is, is in place once and for all. <coughs> Because, it, because the self-centeredness comes and goes and returns. But for the most part, uh, we should be having all these things. I, I run into people sober 15, 20. I, cause I, was in, I was in the liquor business for 20 years of my sobriety, I guess. I would run into members of Alcoholics Anonymous that are so asleep to alcoholism and recovery, they'd say things to me like, well, how could you work around alcohol? I almost, I, just, I would just say, well, God does for me. I almost wanted to say, how could you not understand that alcohol is not the problem? Haven't you ever worked the steps? Or you would, if you'd worked the steps, you wouldn't even, it'd be a knucklehead question. You wouldn't even, you, would, you wouldn't even ask that question. Right? You wouldn't even ask it. It'd be, it'd be a stupid question. It's not stupid when you're new. I, my, my first sponsor worked in the liquor business. I met people in AA. That were, one of the guys that helped me a lot was a bartender. I remember looking, looking at him like, oh, I'm not like you. No, I couldn't be around alcohol and stay sober. But I hadn't worked the steps. I hadn't worked the steps yet. Nothing had changed inside of me. I took that. I went after they checked that guy in. I'm riding home, and I understood that this was my primary purpose. There was a there was a moment, and I've re, it's been a recurring moment for me, in that thing that happens, when you're helping someone else, or you taste it, you taste it, and I think to myself, I want to feel like this the rest of my life. I sponsor a guy who, who calls it, he says, tw talks about 12-step work, he says, that's the good dope. <laughs> if you, if, if I were to, 
and I don't think I could, I don't, matter of fact, I know I couldn't have, but if I could have stayed physically sober 10 years without doing any 12 step work, I would be on medication. I would have to be, or I'd be back to drinking, one or the other. I couldn't do it. I, I'm like Bill Wilson. If I'm not, if I'm not hands on trying to help somebody every day, if my phone's not ringing every day, if I'm not having people in my life to other center me and pull me out of myself, what happens? I go the other way. I go right back into me again. I, not because I'm a bad guy. And the knowledge that I, sh I shouldn't be self-centered doesn't help it. You, you know? I mean, I, I, I bet you mostly had that experience that you're somewhere in sobriety and all of a sudden you realize, oh, the problem is I'm self-centered. Oh, I will just won't be that way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the knowledge, self-knowledge doesn't help us. <clears throat> But I can bring grace to bear in my life to be relieved of the bondage of self if I show up and I try to help God's kids. This is our twelfth and final suggestion. I think it is the accumulation of everything we do here. You know, Ralph was talking about the promises and they're kind of funny, but yet yet that most of us that have done it been in the trenches, we've experienced about everything on that list, really. And oddly enough, I look back over my the last 30 years, some of the fondest memories are, are, the, are the crazy stuff that happens. You know, the guy who comes to the trailer door with a 30-06, you know, and you go, oh, boy. <laughs> right? The crazy stuff that happens. Um, one of the things that, uh, that's true in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's those, we have two groups here. There are those who do, and there are those who judge. The judges never do. They're too busy judging, and the doers, and the and the doers never judge. They're too busy doing. Get in with the doers. Stay away from the judges. Doctor Bob, in his last talk, warned us about the erring member in our tongues. I know guys that, that can tell you everybody that's everything that's wrong with everybody in AA, but. They won't set themselves aside. Get with the doers. The downside of being a doer in Alcoholics Anonymous is you're you're also a target. People will talk, they will judge you. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Matter of fact, the more visible and more active in Alcoholics Anonymous, the more target you big bigger target you are. It's just a part of the territory. If you're willing to go to any lengths, you're willing to you're willing to take it. Sometimes it'll hurt your feelings. People will tell stories about you that aren't even true. The truth would have been more interesting. <laughs> really? Want to talk some? Want to talk some stuff about me? I'll give you some stuff that's really a lot more fun than the stuff you're making up. Really, this is better. This is more. In, this is better. And I was up in Maine on a Geographic, and I, I one of the things I did up there is I worked on a lobster boat. I was pulling traps. Hard, it's hard work. And my first day on this lobster boat, it was a. They, they, as you're pulling traps, you, you get a lot of crabs get in the traps. Now, the lobster guys don't want the crabs. And so instead of throwing them back overboard, they throw them into this bucket. It's about, about this high and about this big around. And after a while, after a couple hours, they'll get a couple hundred crabs in there because there's quite a few crabs in some of these traps. You're pulling one trap right after another. And I'm look. I'm standing on that deck, and I'm looking, and the crabs are about ready to get out of the bucket. They're climbing up the sides. They're just. They're like this far. They're, they're going to get out. And I said to this guy, I said, "You need to cover that bucket." He said, "No, we don't." I said, "I'm telling you, you need to cover that bucket. Look, any second now, they're going to spill over under the deck." He said, "No, they're not." He says, "Watch," and I'm watching, and every time a crab would get to the point where he's coming out. The other ones couldn't stand it, and they'd pull him back down again. <laughs> and I realized they never have to cover those crab buckets. Stick with the doers. You stick with the judges. You're in a crab bucket. You'll never, you'll never, you'll never, you'll never. Spe your soar, your spirit will never soar. Because at the end of the day, was I kind and loving towards all? Did I take my rightful place as a servant? And I think that's the point here. Um, 
we we have we are given something here that I think is a divine gift, and that is that we are, our experience through the twelve steps is no matter how horrid it is, it's made useful. I'll say this and I'll, and I'll, I'll stop. Um, I noticed when I was new something that uh, some, not all of the old timers, but there were some of them that seemed to have this light about them. And as I observed them, I noticed that they seemed to know exactly who they were. And they seemed to know exactly what their life was about. They weren't lost and, and with a feeling of uselessness like I was. Like, where, where should I work? What should I do when I grow up? You know, what, 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 what? They, they had this security, this sense that appears to be self-confidence, but it's not really, I found out later. It's a, it's a confidence in something else. And the reason that they had appeared to be that way is because they were. They knew exactly who they were. They were, were blessed with a spiritual malady called alcoholism and given the responsibility to treat it for the sure joy of it. And they, were, they knew exactly what their life was about because they were given a primary purpose, a purpose greater than themselves, and that they, they, weren't exist, they didn't exist to become rich and famous and to get attention and to get gratified and get laid and buy stuff. They existed and were given the ability to help others. And all of a sudden, their life made sense. My life makes sense today. I know who I am, and I know what my life's about. Thank you all for listening. You want to say anything before we? Thank you all for the weekend. Let's Thank let's you. let's close with the Lord's prayer.